and then tonight, Anne Carson's seven words, which I will read in a moment, they brought to mind what Richard Serra once said, I have always preferred poetry and fiction. Poetry condenses. And Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, the hero is he who is immovably centered. Baudelaire translated that line and, you, you, and translated centered by concentré, which in a way is right, around the center, concentrated, which makes sense if you ask me. And Anne Carson's seven words. Third, the first word is German, so don't be afraid. She writes, Dichten equals condensare might sum it up. Please, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Anne Carson. Thank you for coming. Um, I should say maybe by way of introduction, since Paul mentioned um, the lectures you're not going to hear, that I originally wrote the three as a uh, for Cambridge, uh, King's College, Cambridge. In England, they have a lecture series called the Clark Lectures, which is three uh, lectures on any topic the speaker wishes to address related to the humanities. And so um, I thought, first of all, to write about stillness, a lecture on stillness. And then I needed a series, so I thought, and this seemed to me a genius idea at the time, that I would go on from stillness to the complication of stillness, which is the corner, and then put stillness and corners together as chair. And I still think that's pretty, pretty smart. <laughs> um, and they sort of liked it. I don't know, it's hard to tell with English people. But anyway, for this venue, I had to choose one, and I chose the one on corners, partly because it's in some degree about my dad, who's no longer with us, and but I thought you would like him. Um, and my dad and I had this sort of relationship, which maybe some of you who are my age had with your parents. It was typical of the 50s, 60s, kind of family, a relationship in which we never spoke. And we liked each other fine, but we just did not communicate. And uh, the only way we did relate verbally was by telling each other really bad jokes. <laughs> so here's my dad's favorite joke. Where do otters come from? Give up? Yes. Otter space. <laughs> There you have it. And that is the most fun you're going to have for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> A lecture on corners. The man comes into the kitchen. It is just before dawn. There is thunder outside which pleases him. There's a woman sitting in the corner of the room. I imagine her shadow reaching up the wall. She's grinding corn, bent, bent over a mill wheel. The other 11 women responsible for grinding the corn of the house are in bed asleep, but this one, who is the frailest and slowest of them, did not finish her portion of grinding during the day, so she grinds at night. She too hears the thunder and is pleased. Thunder from a clear sky means gods are paying attention. The woman stops her wheel and addresses the gods. Father Zeus, 
ruler of gods and men. Things are bad here. Accomplish a prayer for me as I say it. Let this be the last and final day on which the suitors feast in the halls of Odysseus. Every time I reread book 20 of the Odyssey, every time the man comes out at dawn to find the woman in the corner grinding corn, I am returned to the days of living with my father in his dementia years. I was familiar with kitchens at dawn in those days. I had begun to get up earlier and earlier in the morning to avoid dad. No sooner did he hear me in the kitchen than he appeared, dressed in pajamas and fedora, to begin the barrage of questioning that was his defense against inner chaos. He needed to control something. If I were going for a walk, he wanted to know every twist and turn of the route I would take. If I were going for a swim, we lived on a lake, he insisted on coming down to the shore with me, launching the rowboat, and following me up and down the water as I did my laps. Odysseus is a stranger in his own house in Odyssey 20. I've come to place this scenario in my mind alongside myself stealing about a sleeping house at dawn as if to collapse the two scenes into a single false memory where I was grinding corn one morning when interrupted by my father and cheerfully we both went swimming. Memory can edit reality in some such way, and then the edited version is too good to let go. The fact of the matter was, however, that I swam up and down the lake while he rode along behind me, and no good omen, thunder, or other appeared. The lake at that hour was still as glass. Dad and I, the only commotion. At a certain point one day, I paused my front crawl to turn and look back at this man in pajamas and fedora rowing doggedly after me on the silent lake. I can still see this in my mind as if it were a scene in a play. Not an epic poem of Homer, after all, but a stage play. As Dad, Dementia, and I contemplated one another from three corners of what might be called a pinter pause, the theater of the absurd presented itself, not just because of the early dawn silence and weirdness of it all, but the feeling that we could not do otherwise, the whole sensation of being caught in a script with moves blocked out for us and characters inescapable. For a pinter pause rests on silence and suppression, the abyss under chat, as somebody said, but it also makes use of movement and precise blocking of characters. I do think choreographically, Pinter said in an interview. Living within the bizarre daily choreography of someone else's dementia, it was a relief to feel that Pinter had been there first in works of art with a beginning, middle, and end. I have sometimes wondered if this is what Aristotle means by catharsis but I don't really think so. Corners are what make a grid different than a line, a plaid shirt different than a striped one, a soccer pitch different than a field, an elbow different than an arm, light as a wave different than light as a particle. Corners make personalities out of persons, maps out of surveillance, and a healthy brain into a demented one. Brain cells depend on nutrients delivered by a cell transport system that has straight lines like a railroad track. The tracks are normally kept straight by a brain protein called tau, unless its function is disrupted by plaque, which tangles, disrupts, and disables the lines. Then clumps and corners form, and the brain starts to starve a bit. The starving brain is surprised. It doesn't know itself or know the world. It keeps arriving at difficulty. Difficulty is dealt with in different ways by different brains. And all of this happens bewilderingly gradually. A common feature is to keep pretending everything is normal as long as possible. 
You know what daily life is supposed to sound like and look like and taste like. You can put that surface together, keep it running, long after there stops being anything inside. You can act the parts. There is a kind of drastic psychic economy to it, a costume of standard behavior constructed out of shreds of the original person and tatters of his old relationships with other people. He is becoming an X-ray of himself. You work with that. His language diminishes to word salad. You converse with that. His fatherliness dissolves apace with your daughterliness. You fake it. You both fake it. Maybe. You wonder this. Heroic and deeply funny, he sends out coded messages from the interior of himself using whatever tools he has left. One evening I was in the kitchen making salad. He drifted through the room in his vague way, in his fedora, and over his shoulder as he passed, he said, the letters of your lettuce are very large. Then he laughed. I laughed. It was one of our good evenings. Speaking of faking it, though, the, here's a passage from Antonia Fraser's memoir of life with Harold Pinter her diary entry from June 14, 1975, a summer's day of unusual heat, and the day after she had agreed to marry Harold Pinter without yet informing the current husband, whose name was Hugh. Quote, the next day I had to tell Hugh. It was beyond ghastly, beginning with the moment when I fetched him inside from the thunderous garden where he was smoking and reading the Financial Times. It now thundered inside. In the end, I summoned Harold round. Harold drank whiskey, Hugh drank brandy, I sat. Hugh and Harold discussed cricket at length, then the West Indies, then Proust. I started to go to sleep on the sofa. Harold politely went home. Nothing was decided. We could quote Oscar Wilde here, but Aristophanes of Byzantium said it earlier, addressing the comic playwright Menander, O oh, Menander and life, which of you imitated the other? Clearly, Lady Fraser's diary entry from June 14th, with its surface of mad affability, its undertow of pain, its thunder inside, and beautiful triangular economy, would make a great pinter play. Economy, in particular, was important to Pinter. He said in an interview that he prided himself on, quote, economy of movement and gesture, of emotion and its expression, both the internal and the external in specific and exact relation, so there is no wastage and no mess. So too did the ancient Greek playwrights value economy and make decisions about stagecraft and aesthetic design based on this, which returns us to the topic of corners. Three corners make a Sophoclean play work. His extant plays consistently present a triangle of three speaking actors. According to Aristotle, it was Sophocles in the fifth century BC who introduced the third actor, to a dramatic tradition that had contented itself with two until then. Since Aristotle, living in the second half of the fourth century, appears to know nothing of any fourth actor, it seems that the practice of using three became canonical. Scholars refer to this as the three-actor rule. No one knows why it was a rule. Why did they stop at three? One hypothesis is economic. Actors were highly trained and highly paid professionals with salaries underwritten by the state. Since the plays were presented in the context of a competition, as soon as one playwright decided to use three actors, everybody would want three actors, and the annual theater budget would sharply rise. Besides that, the evidence of Sophocles' stagecraft might suggest that three actors are really all you need to make a tragedy work. Each of his plays presents harrowing triangular situations 
where two characters bring pressure to bear on a third who is trapped between them and cracks open, or two knowledges that collide together to force out a third that nobody wants to see. We can think of the opening scene of the Ajax, where Athena and Odysseus hunt down poor mad Ajax, or Oedipus the king, where the king, the messenger, and the herdsman lock in a conversational pattern that spits out Oedipus' guilt. No one can operate this three-corned machinery better than Sophocles. But I wonder what it was like to be one of his rival playwrights the year Sophocles decided to demand a third actor. Suddenly the other guys, too, would have to come up with a new way to make a play work, having a third body on stage, a third psyche in the chemistry of the cast, and a third corner to the concept. Circumstantial evidence suggests that this took place in 458 BC. Sophocles' principal rival that year was Aeschylus, who was 67 and two years away from death. Aeschylus had spent the last 40 years producing plays for the Festival of Dionysus and had won first prize 12 times. None of these plays had any use for a third actor. Unfortunately, we don't know what play Sophocles presented in 458, but Aeschylus produced the Oresteia trilogy, which won first prize. It makes use of a third actor in all three parts. Let's look at two of the scenes where a third actor figures. There is a gleam of one-upmanship in the manner of it. The Agamemnon, the first play of the Oresteia trilogy, opens with an announcement of the fall of Troy, then Clytemnestra, the queen, comes on stage to await the return of her husband. Clytemnestra, first actor. Next, Agamemnon enters with an entourage of prisoners of war. Agamemnon, second actor. Amid the prisoners is Cassandra, princess of Troy and concubine of Agamemnon, third actor. But this third actor doesn't speak for a long, long time. Husband and wife trade apologias of their virtue back and forth for 192 lines while Cassandra listens. Or doesn't listen, it is unclear whether she is stubborn, stupid, psychotic, or doesn't know the language. <laughs> All these possibilities are advanced by Clytemnestra who interrogates Cassandra after Agamemnon has gone inside. Cassandra's silence remains impermeable. Clytemnestra eventually exits in a rage. As soon as she exits, Cassandra screams and launches into 258 lines of prophecy, outlining the past, present, and future of the house of Atreus, as well as the imminent doom of all three major characters. <laughs> Aeschylus has taken this device of the third actor introduced by Sophocles for who knows what technical reasons of his own, and used it to transcend normal limits of space and time and intelligence. Cassandra shines with mental power, which is also moral power, and she has more forms of truth than she can live with. She is merely a third angle of the tragic triangle, but her silence pulls all the focus of the story into that corner and explodes it. Silence is a big, crude, theatrical substance. Harold Pinter used it to Aeschylean effect in a 1961 play called A Slight Ache, in which a husband and wife, Edward and Flora, interact with a man who sells matches in much the same way Clytemnestra interacts with Cassandra in the Agamemnon. The match seller stands silent for the length of the play while Edward and Flora interrogate him. Violent forms of truth emerge from husband and wife. The end is tragic. Edward suddenly, for no reason, falls to the floor and is replaced as husband by the match seller. It is a typically unpleasant pinter play. 
The characters exist in a suspension of humaneness. Edward and Flora strike poses rather than talking or touching. It's hard to feel pity or fear for either of them, or for the match seller, whose silence pulls the focus of the story onto himself, but then swallows it. He never speaks. We never find out what things are like on his strange side of reality. Pinter has said in interviews that he thinks most human talk is an evasion, a desperate rearguard attempt to keep ourselves to ourselves. Quote, communication is too alarming. To enter into someone else's life is too frightening. To disclose to others the poverty within us is too fearsome a possibility. He intends his characters who speak to speak the language of what we say instead of what we mean. The silent match seller is a step beyond that. He neither speaks nor means anything. He has given up on language. In the Agamemnon, Aeschylus uses Cassandra's silence at first to tease us into thinking she has given up on language and at the same time perhaps tease us into thinking this playwright doesn't know how to use his third actor. <laughs> then her mouth opens and language pours all over the place. He does something equally adept in the coeferoi, libation bearers as it's called in English, the second play of the Oresteia, which has a third actor in only one scene the scene where Orestes murders his mother. Third actor is Orestes' trusty comrade Pylades, who enters the play beside Orestes at line 20 and stands unspeaking, unaddressed, and unmentioned through 898 lines of action and dialogue. Then at line 899, Orestes, hesitating to murder his mother, turns to Pylades and says, Pylades, what should I do? <laughs> From his all but forgotten corner, the trusty one utters three lines of encouragement and the tragedy plunges on to its end. It would be hard to mistake Aeschylus's dramaturgic control of Sophocles' newest innovation. Corners part two. The person I live with says our house is too dark. It's true we have no big overhead fixtures or lighting tracks, just small thrift store lamps placed here and there. It constitutes a main difference between him and me, between extroverts and introverts generally, between people who prefer to live in a centrally and democratically lit open space and people who like a darkish room with a small pool of lamplight in one corner. The difference between exposure and retreat. To be retreated into one's corner can be a situation of personal peace. If we think of the corner as a sort of half box, part walls, part door, that is, as a place offering defense at the back and mobility at the front, a perfect middle term in what Bachelard calls the dialectics of inside and outside. One thing I noticed about my dad as he disappeared into his dementia, he lost the sense of the personal peace of corners. A man who had always preferred to sit in a rocking chair in the corner of his room with the cat on his lap, reading or thinking or watching the world go by, began to be perched, found perched on a folding chair in the middle of the front lawn, or standing halfway down the driveway with a baffled look, or simply wandering room to room with his hat on. I am the space where I am, says a poem cited by Bachelard. Demented people do not seem to experience the self as a shelter. There is some basic animal certainty that you are who you are and it's okay, that is confiscated from them. No more dialectic of inside and outside, you are simply exposed, you are open to all the winds. Your life is taking place in that space the ancient Greek philosophers call to aperon, 
the unbounded, synonymous with chaos for Hesiod, while to Shakespeare it might be the Heath, to Emily Bronte, the Moors, and to Samuel Beckett, a late evening in the future, but which my dad acutely described in the last complete sentence I had from him in this way, fires are the furthest in you are and the worst you are. Notice the direction of the fires. I'm pretty sure Emily Bronte and Shakespeare and the Greeks would chart a course for the unbounded by going out, not in. But when the unbounded comes after you, when you can't escape it outwardly because it is already inside and already burning, then you have really no shelter. This is a question commonly asked by the last character left alive at the end of a Greek tragedy. Now where can I go? Most extant Greek tragedies have substantially the same set. The action takes place in and out of a house, as human tragedies take place in and out of a mind. The house of a Greek play is most often the home of the protagonist, for example, Agamemnon's palace in the Agamemnon, or else a surrogate home, someplace the protagonist feels safe or locates their identity, like the tent of Ajax in the Ajax, or the temple of Apollo in the Coiferoi. Our house is our corner of the world, Bachelard says. The house of a Greek tragedy is also a kind of riddle, with its dialectic of inside and outside. The house is a container holding an answer to some question that is posed outside on the space of the stage. The aim of the play's action is to bring the inside out, to expose what lies hidden in the house some knowledge contained there. Remember the warning remark of the watchman in the opening scene of the Agamemnon. The house itself, could it but get a voice, would speak out all too clear. When the house speaks, it will ruin the people inside. We look forward to that ruination from the time we take our seats at the start of the play. Greek tragedians found a sensational way to maximize the theatrical effect of the moment when the house speaks by making it explosively plastic and visual. Aeschylus is sometimes credited with the invention of a piece of stage machinery called the enkuklema, which means a thrust out thing or rolled out platform. Experts disagree on this, but we know that this device, a wooden platform on wheels, was used in the centuries after Aeschylus, and it would have worked spectacularly well at the climax of the Agamemnon, when Clytemnestra makes her final appearance on stage, standing over the dead bodies of Agamemnon and Cassandra, and launching into her famous declaration, I stand where I struck. Presumably when she says this, she is visible to the audience amid a tableau of bloody victims. At any rate, the violent extrusion of inside to outside would effectively cap the suspense of the action so far, which Aeschylus has been ratcheting up for 1,300 lines as we watch people go in and out of the house saying ominous things about it and sending back the odd blood-curdling scream. It is a mark of Pinter plays that he achieves an Aeschylean effect, a sense of some private horror extruded to public view with ruinous consequence, without blood-curdling screams or dead bodies on view or mechanical platforms. The action is inside a house. The violence is inside chit-chatting characters. The explosion of knowledge, if there is one, happens inside the audience. The dialectic of inside and outside has been reabsorbed by the play and is felt as an atmosphere of menace pervading banal conversations and light gestures. There are questions and answers everywhere, but they don't fit together. When Edward, at the end of Pinter's A Slight Ache, suddenly falls to the 
the floor, the play gives us no reason for this. If he has been felled by the axe of his wife, it was done internally. The big riddle of the match seller remains unsolved. All our knowledge of these people and their motives is a mystery. And yet, another interesting thing about Pinter, for all its repression and menace and horrible emotions, there is something cozy in a Pinter play. Compare a Beckett play, say, Waiting for Godot. What is so immediately desolate about Waiting for Godot as soon as the curtain rises? Maybe the fact that it has no house. Pinter plays generally take place in a house. Each character starts out in their little corner of the world, however ruined, psychotic, or hopeless. The stage set for the opening act of Waiting for Godot is given as, quote, an undefined place with tree. <laughs> Bachelard says a house is a psychic state. Waiting for Godot offers no state. Here is no inside or outside, no structure that might open up to reveal something else. If the play contains a knowledge or poses a riddle, it is a riddle distributed everywhere, structurelessly. I wonder why he added the tree. Beckett wondered this too, <laughs> eventually. In 1961, the play was revived in Paris, and Beckett hired Giacometti to make the tree. One can see the attraction. <laughs> Not just the desolation, the gash surfaces the primordial manner of Giacometti's figures, there was a sense of self-consciousness, almost despair, about the limitations of their art that Beckett and Giacometti shared. Beckett wanted a tree that cried out, as Giacometti did once in an interview with David Sylvester, quote, I don't know if I work in order to do something or in order to know why I can't do what I want to do. It's a lot to ask of a tree. <laughs> Beckett did not, at first, like the tree Giacometti made. It was reconsidered, redesigned, and remade, ending up as the straight, spindly white plaster thing that one spectator likened to a drain pipe. The tree had six leaves. In the end, Beckett called it superb, the one bright spot in this so far dreary exhumation. <laughs> Looking at pictures of this set and this tree, I was reminded of something told me by a friend who is a child psychologist. When children get therapy, they're often asked to draw a picture of their house, as this is believed to be revelatory of life in the home and life in the mind. Most every kid draws the same house, a square building with central doorway, pointy roof, and chimney exuding smoke. Children of happy families draw the smoke as billowing cloudy curves. Children of broken or difficult homes are inclined to make straight thin smoke. Straight thin smoke does seem to me worse, more depressing than no smoke at all or refusing to draw one's house. When the Swiss novelist Max Frisch was dying, he gave a final interview in which he described a dream he kept having. In the dream, he sees Max Frisch balanced on the curve of the earth, but just starting to slide off. An empty stage with white plaster tree gives just enough curve to the earth, just enough boundary to the unbounded to suggest the beginning of real terror. The unbounded, in Greek, to aperon, a word formed by adding the negative prefix alpha to the noun perar, which is thought to mean rope end. Unboundedness is a rope not tied off at the end to prevent its unraveling. The first person to use this word as a metaphysical value was the philosopher Anaximander, 
who described to Aperon as the arche of all things. Arche meaning origin, first cause, first principle, or beginning. And in Aristotle's account, the unbounded is abhorrent because it is nothing but beginning. Aristotle says, nature flees from the unbounded, the unbounded is imperfect or incomplete, and nature always seeks completion. Corners part three. So, on the one hand, we can regard corners as shelter, comfort, containment, completion, what Stevie Smith calls four walls and a pot of jam, something valued for their boundaries and useful in their form. On the other hand, the phrase to be cornered can signify a wish to escape or dissolve or deny the threat of angles closing. Let's say you're losing an argument or retreating from an enemy army or you're a fox on Saturday morning in a ditch outside Downton Abbey. And then there are people who want or need cornerlessness for its own sake. I once gave a lecture at the European Graduate School, located in a small town high in the Alps, and was taken by car up one of those death-defying switchback mountain roads that circles round and round the edge of an abyss. We were passed by several buses hurtling down the road in the opposite direction. I asked our driver about accidents on the road, and he confessed that he had wondered the same thing when he first moved to the area and had gone to the local bus company to ask for actuarial statistics. <laughs> the bus company told him they'd in fact never had a bus crash on the road, but that four times in their history, a driver at some point mid-route had steered his bus to the side of the road stepped out and quietly dropped himself over the side of the mountain. The lure of the abyss can be fatal, or it can be domesticated as a desire for infinite going, restlessness, wanderlust, walks. You don't have to hit the ground to experience cornerless space. Legend and literature offer a number of examples of people who could not sit still, like St. James, the son of Zebedee, who walked from the Holy Land to the Iberian Peninsula in the first century, inaugurating a famous pilgrimage route to Compostela. Or Matsuo Basho, the 17th century Japanese poet, whose narrow road to the north is now available in a penguin paperback or as a nine-day, eight-night fully guided tour. Or the English poet John Clare, who took it in his head one July day of 1841 to walk from High Beach Asylum, a private institution near Epping Forest where he had committed himself in 1837, to London, a journey of eight days and 90 miles, during which he subsisted on grass and tobacco. The walking impulse for John Clare had something to do with his sense of humor. In the madhouse, I could find no mirth pay, he opaquely said. And then there was Holderlin, the glorious madman and translator and German lyric poet. Early December 1801, Holderlin set out from his mother's house in Nürtingen to walk to Bordeaux, a distance of some 600 miles having accepted a post as tutor in the house of a certain Herr Meyer. He arrived at the end of January, but resigned the post in mid-May and took to the road again, reaching Stuttgart in early July. His friends did not recognize him when he came in the door. His report from the road was, Apollo struck me. Holderlin explained his walking in a letter of 1802. Quote, I am pulled as rivers are towards the end of something, something expanding like an Asia. He had for several years been working on translations of Sophocles' Oedipus plays, 
and in the process began revising his own early poetry as if it too were a foreign language, trying to travel ever deeper into German, into his own sentences, as into another country. Men learn more in the scorch of deserts, he wrote in a late fragment. His manuscripts are sometimes illegible palimpsests of versions and revisions and afterthoughts. Whether he improved his poems by treating them as infinitely unraveling rope ends is unclear. He had an absolute and religious faith in the powers and process of nature and seemed to believe his poetry was part of that process, able to dissolve and reform as organic phenomena do. And he did not, as Michael Hamburger puts it, he did not allow self-preservation to set a limit to his quest. But perhaps Aristotle is right that there is something abhorrent in endless beginnings. Holderlin's psyche felt the pressure. The state of dementia in which he lived the final 37 years of his life in a tower overlooking the river Neckar is well documented. This is a comment of a friend who visited him in his tower. He seems to be still walking. Quote, for the last six years, he goes back and forth from morning till evening in his room, murmuring to himself. At night, he gets up and walks about the house, or sometimes stops to blacken any piece of paper he finds by covering it with words. At the stairs, we had a final glimpse of him, striding in his room, pressing on. Holderlin not only denies confinement by going for walks inside his room, he cancels the conventional corners of legibility, blackening any piece of paper he finds by covering it with words. It is a different kind of restlessness, crowding the paper with words all the way to the edge so there's no difference between text and margin. Language, he says in a late fragment, is the most dangerous of good things. I wonder what the danger is that Holderlin fears. Does it have to do with control, too little control, too much control, or just the very, very, very intoxicating idea of control itself? You may know that story by Borges called The Exactitude of Science in which a guild of cartographers decide to make a map of their empire that is of the same scale as the empire and coincides with it point for point. My question would be, where do you keep such a map? <laughs> do you roll it up and store it in the cupboard of another empire about the same size as the original empire? Or does it lie over top of and coextensive with the original empire as if to pin down every real-world coordinate with the corresponding cartographic coordinate, like a kind of lunatic Xerox copy. Which is what my dad decided to do with his real world towards the end of his time with us. That is, to pin down every moment of his day by writing little scribbled notes to himself, mapping out almost simultaneous with himself, the landscape of every action, responsibility, or fear. Turn out the lamp, put the keys in the drawer, go eat supper. We found these notes all over the house after he was gone, in books, in his pockets, under the cat's dish, behind the clock. He was going for control. Like Borges map makers, he had a bit of a problem with the scale. The first person credited with drawing a scaled map of the world was Anaximander, that pre-Socratic philosopher we already met, quoted by Aristotle for his views on the bounded and the unbounded. Anaximander's views are breathtakingly unclear. Nothing of his writing has come down to us except one fragment and a bunch of paraphrases. Anaximander did not like to explain himself, is a complaint already voiced in ancient times. 
Whether his apeiron, his unbounded, should be interpreted as spatially or temporally without limits, or perhaps as that which has no qualifications, or as that which is inexhaustible, remains controversial. What comes through is that he saw the cosmos as a kind of contest between the bounded and the unbounded. But then who doesn't? My dad and Holderlin are not the only people desperate for more control of the world around them, not to say the world within them, in an ongoing daily way. Yet it remains puzzling and provocative why Anaximander, in his famous Fragment One, insists on assimilating this contest to the language of justice and injustice. His Fragment One says, whence things have their coming into being, so they have their passing away, for they give justice and recompense to one another for their injustice, according to the ordinance of time. I could never quite get my head around what kind of justice this is, or what it might have to do with my dad trying to Xerox his own mind, a situation in which I would have liked to find any glimmer of justice available at the time, but failed to do so. So let's go back to corners and cornerlessness in a more concrete form. Let's talk about the Gansfeld. Corners part four. Physics has defined the phenomenon of the Gansfeld effect, whereby exposure to an unstructured uniform sensation, like a very great deal of white light, as in a blizzard or dense fog, deprives you of navigational clues. You cannot tell up from down or inside from outside. You cannot focus what you're seeing. You may go blind, you may hallucinate, some people get anxious, some get very calm. I was in a Gansfeld recently, one installed by James Terrell in an art museum called Mass Mocha in North Adams, Massachusetts. It is a three-sided room built into a wall of the museum and filled with an indefinable uniform light, sometimes red, sometimes green, sometimes blue a light so total and soaking that the room seems to have no walls or ceiling or proportions or end. It is just light and it floods you with its simplicity. The unbounded is largely simple. There is a strange pressureless pressure. I had the certainty, which was mistaken, that if I dropped and fell, the light would catch me all round like a quilt. In fact, I would have hit the concrete floor and injured myself. I am not the only person who has had this illusion. More than one has fallen and more than one has sued James Terrell for large sums of money. <laughs> From the depths of the Gansfeld, I could look out and see people passing. They had a hectic, over-emphatic atmosphere about them like someone wearing opera makeup off stage. Not that they were especially lipsticked or moving especially fast, but it was as if I could perceive them living fast. Their livingness inside them was going at a different pace than mine and had a different, perhaps unnecessary, brightness. Mine was slow and blurred and disseminated through the light of the air of the Gansfeld. Mine was all inside itself and unconcerned with being seen outside. I thought perhaps these people passing had no inside, or at least they were making very little use of it. They were gazing out operatically. I was living somehow a few moments of time prior to all that opera. Or another way to put it, they seemed like people in italics, leaning forward in time, stressing themselves. If italics are a mode of stress, I felt restored to some plainer condition, like a word or phrase being emphasized within a text that is already in italics, so the printer has to reverse it to upright. 
I was aware of being singularly upright. This sounds self-congratulatory, but felt oddly egoless. At the same time, it might be said there's nothing more egoistic than feeling or arranging to feel egoless. <laughs> Take the corners out, put the corners back in. At the opposite pole from the egolessness of the Gansfeld is New York City real estate. <laughs> real estate, this odd expression, what is real about real estate? Gordon Matter Clark, the New York conceptual artist, entertained this question in a sort of pre-Socratic way. This was 1973. He purchased 15 lots of New York City real estate, 14 in Queens and one in Staten Island. These were tiny residual scraps of land, some narrower than a person's shoulders, which had escaped official zoning and the avarice of developers. Most were bits of sidewalk or gutter space or a strip down somebody's driveway. Gordon Matta Clark bought them at public auction for $25 and called them metaphoric voids or the place where you stop to tie your shoe. He mapped them, measured them, photographed them, and cataloged the properties, but had no purpose in mind beyond the joy and mischief of introducing an extra bit of justice into the Anaximandrian grid of New York City. His comments to the press were fairly literal. The wild dogs, the junkies, and I used these spaces to work out some life problems, he said. <laughs> Overall, there was something truly unbounded in the spirit of 70s conceptual art with its harebrained and socially redeeming adventures. But in this case, the adventure did not survive the era. Gordon Matta Clark died in 1978, and the properties were repossessed by the city for non-payment of taxes. Whence things have their coming into being, so they have their passing away. For they give justice and recompense to one another for their injustice according to the ordinance of time. Or, as my pre-Socratic dad used to say back in the good years, by means of a box of matches, you can demonstrate almost anything in the world except a box of matches. Thank you and good night.